Welcome to another deep dive. This time, we're really getting into it with some uh, fascinating stuff. Oh, yeah. You provided some really interesting source material on this whole relationship between religion and politics. Right. And we're going to be exploring it all through the lens of this book, The Disclosure of Politics by Maria Pialara. Great book. It goes deep. I mean, <laughs> really dope. Yeah, it really does. Into how, you know modern politics kind of carved out its own space, mm -hmm. you know, separate from religion. It's like, how do we get from, you know, the church being the ultimate authority yeah. to this idea of like secular politics? Yeah. Where it's like, whoa, hold on. Maybe there's a different way to think about power and authority. And this book, it goes beyond just, you know, religion versus politics, right? Oh, absolutely. It really dives into the minds of these thinkers. Like, Carl Loweth. Oh, yeah. Loweth's a big one. Reinhard Koselleck. Koselleck's fascinating. Hans Blumenberg. Blumenberg, always challenging assumptions. Hannah Arendt. Andrew Terrace, a true visionary. And Jürgen Habermas. Habermas, bringing in the public sphere. It's like we're getting a front row seat to their intellectual wrestling match. Exactly. And what Lara does so well is she shows how their ideas about this whole untangling of politics from religion what we call secularization. Right. It was all tied up with their vision of what politics should look like, you know, what kind of world they wanted to see. It makes you wonder, like, do we all kind of view the separation of church and state through the lens of our ideal society? It's like our own hopes and dreams are shaping how we see this big idea. Yeah. It's like, wouldn't it be convenient if our understanding of these huge concepts just happened to line up perfectly with what we want politically? Oh, totally. But that's also what makes it so interesting. Yeah. These ideas weren't just born out of thin air, you know? Right. They were shaped by the experiences, mm -hmm. the hopes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The struggles of each of these thinkers. It's like their own lives are woven into the fabric of these ideas. And that's where this whole idea of conceptual history comes in. Oh, conceptual history sounds fancy. It is, but it's also super important. Okay, I'm listening. So one of the thinkers Lara focuses on, Reinhard Koslack. Okay. He argued that the meaning of words, especially these politically charged ones, it's not static. Meaning they don't just stay the same forever? Exactly. They change over time. Yeah. They kind of morph and evolve. Okay, that's interesting. To reflect, you know, the changing world around them. So it's like how the word cool went from describing temperature to something awesome. Exactly. That's a perfect example. It makes you wonder, what words are we using today that are going to, like, totally transform in the future? Right. Like, what will woke mean in 50 years? Mm. Who knows? I don't even know what it means now. Exactly. But let's, uh, you know, rein it in a bit. Okay, sure. Before we go too far down the rabbit hole. Right, right. Let's start with a term that gets thrown around a lot, but maybe not always understood. Okay, which one? Secularization. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. It's like a buzzword, right? Yeah, everyone's talking about secularization this, secularization that. But I'm not always sure everyone really gets what it means. You know, all the layers. It's like there's more to it than meets the eye. Exactly. And like Kosalek pointed out, context is key. Context like the time and place. Exactly. We have to understand when and where a word was used mm -hmm. to really grasp what it meant. So it's not enough to just like look it up in the dictionary. Well, the dictionary can be a starting point, but it doesn't tell the whole story. There's like a deeper story hidden within the word itself. Precisely. And even the word secular itself, it has a pretty wild past. Oh, really? Tell me more. So get this, it comes from the Latin saculum, Saculatum. which was originally linked to concepts like time, generation, and even get ready for it, sex. Wait, sex? Like the birds and the bees kind of sex? The one and only. Yeah. It's crazy, right? That's a wild journey for a word. It is. Yeah. From something so personal and intimate to this big idea about how power is structured. So how did it make that leap? From, you know, generations and, well, sex to separating church and state. Well, it was a gradual shift, of course, over centuries. Centuries, wow. But by the 16th and 17th centuries, secular really started to reflect this transition. What kind of transition? From a world where the church held a lot of political sway mm -hmm. to a world where the state was becoming more independent. Ah, so the concept of secularization was tied to these, like, real-world power dynamic. Absolutely. It wasn't just some abstract philosophical debate. It was about who was really in charge. Exactly. And even today, you see how this term gets used. How so? Well, for instance, some religious groups use secularized to describe what they see as the regular church, mm -hmm. losing its religious fervor, you know, becoming too worldly. 
So it's like one word, but so many layers of meaning, so much history packed into it. Exactly. It's a perfect example of why we can't just take these concepts at face value. Right. There's always more to the story. And that's why it's so important to really understand the specific arguments of these thinkers, Laura, highlights. Like each one had their own take on secularization. Absolutely. Shaped by their own political ideals and the events they lived through. So it wasn't just some abstract, timeless concept. No, it was very much grounded in their own time and place. Okay, so we've established that secularization is a lot more complex than it might seem at first glance. Way more complex. But what about these thinkers themselves? Where do we even begin to unpack their different perspectives on this whole religion and politics thing? Well, Maybe we start with this idea that concepts can actually change what's politically possible. Whoa, hold on. Concepts can actually change what's possible. Yeah, it's like they unlock doors that were previously closed. Oh, okay, that's a powerful idea. It is. They become more than just words. They're like blueprints for action. Can you give me an example? Absolutely. Laura brings up Kant's idea of publicity. Publicity? Like advertising? Not quite, although it's related. Okay, okay. Kant's talking about this idea of open public discourse, mm -hmm. where citizens can debate, critique, right. hold power accountable. So it's like creating a space for transparency and accountability. Exactly. And that seemingly simple idea revolutionized the relationship between people and the state. So are you saying that concepts can act as like political catalysts? I think that's a great way to put it. They can spark new ways of thinking about power, about citizens, about the whole system. Precisely. And this is where things get even more interesting. Okay, I'm hooked. Tell me more. One of the most controversial figures in this whole debate, Carl Lewis. Lewis, okay. He argues that a lot of our modern political concepts, mm -hmm. they're basically translations of religious ideas. Translations. So he's saying that modern politics is just religion with a new label. Well, he's not saying it's that simple, but he is suggesting that there are deep connections. I can see how that would ruffle some feathers. It definitely did. Give me an example. Okay, Lewis points to Hegel's concept of historical progress. Historical progress, like we're always moving towards something better. Yeah, that idea. He says it mirrors the Christian idea of salvation. So instead of reaching heaven, we're striving for some perfect society at the end of history. It's like... Same basic structure, different content. I see what he's getting at, but is it fair to say that all modern political thought is just borrowed from religion? Well, that's where another thinker, Hans Blumenberg, jumps in. Blumenberg, okay. He challenges Loweth's translation theory. So it's like a battle of ideas. Exactly. Everything is recycled religion versus, no, we've created something genuinely new. Blumenberg emphasizes human agency, mm -hmm. our ability to shape our own destiny. So it's not all preordained by some higher power. Not according to Blumenberg. He's saying we have the power to break free from those old narratives. And he brings in this fascinating idea of myth. Myth, like ancient stories and legends. Well, he sees myths as more than just stories. Okay, how so? He says they represent how humans grapple with uncertainty and try to create meaning. So myths are about making sense of the world. And that has implications for how we understand politics, how we organize ourselves, how we make decisions. Myths and politics, that's a connection I wouldn't have made. But it makes sense when you think about it. Okay, I'm intrigued. And then there's Hannah Arndt. She comes to this whole thing from a completely different angle. Right, yeah, she's the one who sees politics as this purely human activity. Right, not about God, not about some grand historical narrative, but about people interacting with each other. So she's like zooming in on the everyday experience of politics. Exactly the nitty gritty of how we relate to each other, how we make decisions, how we create a shared world. That's a refreshing perspective. It is. And to really understand her, we have to dive into her ideas about the polis, the ancient Greek city-state. The polis, that sounds interesting. It is. But that's a story for another time, for part two of our deep dive. Okay, you've got me hooked. I can't wait to hear more. Stay tuned. All right, so we're back, diving deeper into this whole religion and politics thing. Yep, picking up where we left off with Hannah Arndt. Mm -hmm. and her unique take on politics. Right. She was all about the human element, seeing politics as something that emerges from those everyday interactions between people. Exactly. And one of the things she found so fascinating was the ancient Greek polis, the city-state. Oh, polis. Yeah, she saw it as like this model, you know, this ideal of how free individuals can come together, make decisions, shape their world together. And... She's like going way back to the roots of democracy. Right. To a time before 
you know, the whole separation of church and state was even a thing. So what was it about the polis that she found so, like, inspiring? Well, Artip believed that the polis, it embodied a particular kind of freedom. Okay. One that wasn't granted by some higher power, you know, or, like, written down in a constitution. Mm -hmm. But a freedom that emerged from the very act of people coming together. Like participating, being involved. Exactly. Yeah. Engaging in political discourse, mm -hmm. speaking up, debating you know, actually shaping the public sphere. So freedom wasn't just this abstract idea. It was something you created through action, through being politically engaged. Exactly. For her, the polis was where this kind of, you know, creative groundbreaking action could really flourish. So it wasn't just about maintaining the status quo or, you know, preserving existing power structures? No, it was about shaping the future, mm -hmm. about creating something truly new, breaking free from the constraints of the past. It's a powerful vision. It is. And it leads us to two of her most important concepts, action mm -hmm. and power. Okay, I'm listening. Aren't it? She didn't see power as something that individuals or institutions, like, possessed or controlled. Mm -hmm but it's something that emerged from collective action, you know, from people coming together to achieve something. So it wasn't about wielding authority or controlling resources? No, it was about the potential that's unleashed when people unite and act in concert. It makes you think about, like, the power of social movements, right? Yeah. People it, coming together to demand change. Exactly. Art was all about the transformative potential of collective action. How it can, like, break down old barriers and create something new. Precisely. And she saw the polis as this space where that kind of transformation could happen. So how does this all tie back into the debate about religion and politics? Well, Arndt's perspective, it offers a really interesting contrast to Lowith's idea that modern political concepts are just like secularized versions of religious ideas. Right, the, the whole translation theory. Exactly. For Arndt, politics wasn't about finding echoes of religion and political thought. It was about understanding how humans interact and create meaning through action. Precisely. And, you know, it's fascinating to see how these different thinkers approach this whole relationship between religion and politics. We've got Loweth tracing the historical connections, Blumenberg championing human agency. And aren't focusing on the power of collective action. It's like each one gives us a different lens through which to view this whole debate. And that's what makes Laura's book so compelling. You know, yeah. it doesn't give you one neat answer, but rather like this tapestry of interwoven ideas challenging us to think critically. It makes you realize there's no easy answer. Not at all. Yeah. It's all about nuance and grappling with complexity. Speaking of challenging assumptions and offering new perspectives, let's bring in our final thinker, Jürgen Habermas. Ah, yes. Habermas, the champion of the public sphere. Right. That seems super relevant to all of this. Absolutely. Habermas, he picks up on Kant's idea of publicity, but he takes it even further. How so? Well, he develops this whole theory of how public discourse shapes political life. Okay. For Habermas, the public sphere is this space where rational debate, critical thinking, all that good stuff can flourish. It's not just about having the right to speak, but about having those voices heard, right? Exactly. And potentially influencing the decisions of those in power. So he was a big believer in dialogue, in deliberation, in people talking and hashing things out. Absolutely. But he also recognized that the public sphere isn't some neutral zone. Me no. It's shaped by values, by beliefs, by different worldviews, including religious ones. So it's not about excluding religion from the public square. No, it's about acknowledging that religious beliefs play a role. And figuring out how to incorporate those perspectives into the broader conversation. Exactly. In a way that respects both religious freedom and, you know, the principles of democratic deliberation. Sounds like a tricky balancing act. It is. But Habermas argues that it's precisely this tension, this ongoing dialogue between different viewpoints that's vital for a healthy democracy. So instead of trying to silence religious voices, we need to create spaces where they can engage with secular perspectives. Respectfully, productively, you mm, know, yeah. working together to build a society that reflects everyone's values. That's the ideal, right? Finding common ground even amidst differences. Exactly. And that's really what Laura's book is all about, the disclosure of politics. Yeah. She's not giving us a definitive answer on how religion and politics should relate. More like a framework for understanding the complexity of it all. Precisely. Encouraging us to move beyond those simple binaries and embrace the nuance. Recognizing that it's a constantly evolving relationship shaped by so many factors. Exactly. Changing social norms, 
political landscapes, even the meanings of the words we use. It's like this never-ending dance between religion and politics. And that's why it's so important to engage with these ideas, to understand the historical context, to approach it all with a critical eye. Not looking for easy answers, but asking the right question. And being willing to grapple with the complexity. And we're back, ready to wrap up our deep dive into the disclosure of politics. Yeah, it's been quite a journey through the minds of these thinkers. Seriously. Secularization, evolving concepts, that whole dance between religious beliefs and democratic values. I've covered a lot of ground. But, you know, it's not just about exploring these ideas like in a vacuum. Right. It's about figuring out how can we actually apply these insights, you know, to make sense of the world around us. Exactly. So, like, what are the practical takeaways? What can we learn from these thinkers that can help us navigate, you know, the messiness of 21st century politics? Okay, so what are the big lessons here? Well, one thing that really stuck with me was Kalsalek's emphasis on, like, the sheer power of concepts. Right. Right how words can have this huge impact shaping how we think and act. <laughs> exactly. It's like those seemingly simple words, they carry so much weight. Remember how we were talking about publicity earlier? Yeah. How it went from this kind of obscure idea to a cornerstone of modern democracy? Right. It's like who knew one word could be so influential? So it's not just about understanding the issues. It's about understanding the very language we use to talk about them. It's like decoding the hidden meanings and power dynamics embedded in the words themselves. Wow, deep. It is. And it brings up another point that runs through all of these thinkers' work. Which is? The idea that politics, it's inherently a realm of contestation. Meaning there's no easy answers, no one-size-fits-all solutions. Exactly. It's messy. It's dynamic. It's this constant process of negotiation, of debate, of, you know, struggling to create a shared world. Even when we disagree. Especially when we disagree. So it's not about finding some perfect utopia. It's about recognizing that there are multiple perspectives. Right. And respecting those differences. And trying to work together despite those differences. Exactly. And that's where Herbermas' concept of the public sphere is so important. Right, that space for dialogue and debate. He reminds us that democracy, it thrives on that free exchange of ideas. Even when those ideas clash, right? It's through that clash, through the process of arguing and deliberating, that we can hopefully reach better solutions. More just, more equitable. Exactly. And it makes you think about how important it is to protect free speech even when it's uncomfortable, even when we disagree. It's about creating that space where different perspectives can be heard, debated, challenged, and ultimately contribute to a more like vibrant and inclusive democracy. Precisely. And, you know, another key takeaway from all of this is oh, the importance of understanding history. Right. Like where these ideas come from, what context they were born into. Exactly. These thinkers, they were grappling with the legacy of religion in a world that was rapidly changing. Trying to figure out how those old traditions could coexist with, you know, new ways of thinking and organizing society. And it feels like we're facing similar challenges today, right? Totally. We're living in this age of, like, globalization, technology. Shift and change. Where it feels like those traditional values are clashing with, you know, modern ideas. And by looking back at how these thinkers navigated those tensions. We can maybe learn something about how to approach the challenges we face now. Exactly. It's not about just copying their answers, but about understanding their process. Their willingness to, like, really wrestle with those complex questions. And their commitment to finding ways to bridge those divides. So learning from history, not just repeating it. Right. Using that knowledge to inform how we act today, how we shape the future. And I think ultimately the most important lesson we can take away from all of this is... What's that? The importance of critical thinking. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. These thinkers, they were all about questioning assumptions, challenging the status quo, offering new ways of seeing the world. They encouraged us to like really engage with different perspectives. Weigh the evidence. Come to our own conclusions. Not just blindly accepting what we're told. Exactly. It's yeah. about approaching everything with like this healthy skepticism, this willingness to ask questions. And to seek the truth, even when it's uncomfortable. Even when it challenges our own beliefs. Because that's how we grow, right? And that's how democracy thrives. So the disclosure of politics, it's not just a book. It's like a call to action. A reminder that being a citizen in a democracy, it's not passive. It's about participating, engaging, thinking critically, and ultimately taking responsibility for the world we create together. Well said. And on that note, I think we've reached the end of our deep dive. Time to come up for air. 
We've explored some fascinating ideas, tackled some tough questions. Luckily sparked some new thoughts for you, our listeners. So as you go forth into the world, remember those key takeaways. The power of concepts, the messiness of democracy. The importance of history and, of course, critical thinking. And who knows, maybe you'll be the one to disclose a new political reality. Open a door to a brighter future. The possibilities are endless. That's all for this deep dive. Thanks for joining us. Keep exploring, keep learning, keep those brains buzzing. And until next time, dive deep.